Hey, what's up, everybody? It's HBCU Game Day. I'm Tali Carr, joined by Uncle Neely from the M I M I M I M I S S I S S I P P I from the SIP. What's up? <laughs> what's up, brother? How you been, man? Hey, man, cannot complain. How you doing, Tali Carr? Hey, we're doing good, man. We're doing good. Uh, you and I have not talked since uh, the televised blue and white spring game uh, on one of those ESPNs to you. I forgot where I was watching it, uh, but it, it was on the, the on the big ship there. Uh, man, let's start here. Uh, if anybody was like, hmm, how good is Travis Hunter really? <laughs> it did not take long uh, to see he is as advertised, maybe a little more. Yeah, you know, uh, he hit the ground running, man. First play uh, was uh, to Travis Hunter. Uh, did not score on that first play, but he showed off his speed coming out of the, the backfield. Backfield, I think it was a jet sweep or something like that that was run. Uh, but he, he was able to get interceptions on defense and scored a reception uh, touchdown on offense. Uh, and so he is exactly as advertised as Bill. But we also can't lose in that shuffle uh, Kevin Coleman, uh, you know, who announced he was coming to Jackson State on national TV at a bowl game. And uh, he hit the ground running on, on special teams with a score uh, and also some key receptions. So those two guys, those new additions, if you will, uh, showed what they got on national TV and show that they could live up to the expectation and, and exceed it. You often talk uh, the portal swings both ways. Uh, we saw spring football. Coach Sanders was a part of the telecast in, in more ways than one. Uh, he let everybody know he's going to have to talk to some guys. We've seen some some guys that are, are transferring out. You know, we still continue to see uh, names coming in. Uh, how would you say this roster as it stands right now, when you look at it, uh, heading into the fall, if, if this is what you're going to have uh, compared to last year's team that went unbeaten in SWAC play, fell short in the Celebration Bowl, uh, how do you, how do you stack up this year's roster as of today? I think this roster right now, uh, as we're in the middle of May, is uh, a better roster than the undefeated team that won a swag championship. And I might add to that, Tali, that this roster is still not done. You know, we're at that point of the year uh, where you're looking at this time last year, a James Houston was still not a part of the Tigers team yet. So there are going to be some additions before these guys truly report, report in uh, to summer camp. And those that will be attending summer school, you're going to have some additional names at wide receiver and on defense and defensive line and, and offensive line. So it's not over. But even as it stands, uh, with those who elected to take their talents elsewhere, uh, wishing them the best, once a Tiger, always a Tiger. Uh, but the guys who will be joining this team, uh, augmented by the guys that are already here, I'm telling you that in each position group, there is an upgrade. Neely from the pregame show. I don't think I gave you the proper respect. We just kind of jumped into our conversation. Make sure you check out the double E pregame show. Uh, you talked about James Houston. He was one of the four HBCU players that were drafted uh, this year. That was a big uh, selling point for Coach Sanders, something that he really dug his heels into that he wanted to see get done. A lot of people contributed to that um, of course, without saying, uh, but one of his guys gets drafted uh, the 100th player in Jackson State history to be drafted into the NFL. Um, how significant was was that? I think it's huge. Uh, I think it's huge for uh, for James Houston uh, personally, you know, to transfer to transfer. I'm sorry to Jackson State, uh, seeking greater opportunity than he was given or afforded there at Florida, and to be able to in one season uh, lead the SWAC and lead the nation in categories and show what he has to the NFL uh, and get drafted uh, in that with one year under his belt, I think it really bodes well for all HBCUs as we look to recruit guys in to show that you do have opportunity here, that if you perform, if you put up the numbers, if you have the metrics, if you show out when it's showtime, that they will call your name on draft day, that you don't have to go to a Power 5 to make it to the NFL. And you have several Power 5 teams out there who had nobody drafted. You know, University of Texas, didn't get a single name call. And here you got the, uh, the SWAC and HBCUs with four people called. Uh, so I think it is good for the brand of Jackson State, the brand of Coach Prime, and the overall brand of HBCUs that people around the nation got to see that you could come to an HBCU. And even just with one year, you can move up 
and be a draft eligible player and get your name called on draft day. Uh, he is with the Detroit Lions and, you know, their, their rookie camps and all that kind of thing are taking place right now. Uh, so looking forward to him having an impact in the NFL and, and sticking on that roster there. Uh, I just think, Tali, that it is huge that we were able to get a player drafted in what was Coach Prime's first true season with guys that he truly put together as a team. You know, we had that spring season uh, that he kind of inherited, so to speak. But this past fall uh, was his team and going into next fall, even more so his team. Uh, how big was the switch to defensive end for Houston to allow him to showcase some more abilities um, from his traditional position of linebacker, which he may go back to in the NFL, but being able to get on the edge at Jackson State, how, how big do you think that was in helping him to get drafted? I tell you what, if James Houston doesn't have a Coach Prime, a uh, Coach Dennis Thurman, a Coach Andre Hart, a Coach Jeff Weeks, and all of their infinite NFL experience, and they're able to persuade him that with his skill set and what he brings to the table, that he would be more productive by switching positions, had James not gotten that advice and adhered to that advice, uh, that, that advice, uh, you don't hear James Houston's name called. You know, he's lost in the shuffle nationally. That switch to edge rusher was everything uh, for what his skill set is. Uh, and it shows what a good coaching foundation who guys who know what the NFL is looking for because they've been there. They know how to showcase your speed and put you in the right position to be successful. And James playing linebacker would be a great guy. But James playing linebacker probably does not lead to the states. I'm sorry, the swag and the nation in all those categories and gets picked up on the NFL radar. So hats off to Coach Prime and his coaching staff. And, you know, you can see in the documentary, and I was happy to be a part of some of those conversations where, you know, James Houston was a little concerned about the switch. Uh, you know, he, that wasn't his natural position. And, and it became a thing like, hey, man, trust us. You know, we're not here to put you in a position not to excel. If you don't excel, we don't excel. We're in this thing together. This is a better fit for you. He switched roles and lit up the nation in every category. What do you expect? What are your hopes for him uh, this year? Do you think it'll be a, a slow kind of year to learn? Do you think he'll, he'll get a lot of action? What, what, what thoughts do you have? What have you been hearing? I'm optimistic. Uh, you know, he went to a team that needs him. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, guys get, get drafted in positions where you got to kind of fight your way and fall to make the roster, let alone playing time. Uh, but he went to a, a team that truly needs an impact player on defense. And if James Houston is able to show what he can do, uh, which he did in the SWAC, so I know he'll be able to show it, I'm expecting him to not only make the roster, but to also get some playing time and contribute. Here's a fun fact for you, Tolly Carr, as it relates to Detroit Lions and drafting somebody from Jackson State and if they can contribute. Do you know that on Liam Barney's first play, his rookie season with the Detroit Lions, he picked off Bart Starr for the Green Bay Packers and took it back for a touchdown. So if history is on our side, James Houston is going to have some major impact week one for the Detroit Lions. Wow, picking off white Jesus. That, that's pretty big right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> on play numero uno, we'll, we'll take that. Uh, wow, uh, there's so much to get into. NIL has been a hot topic. Um, Deion Sanders has has been weighing in on that. He's called it uh, uh, free agency. He said it's not name, image, and likeness. It, it's pay-per-view. <laughs> the NCAA has kind of issued uh, some guidance, they called it on earlier this week, uh, where they needed to kind of redefine what a booster is as they try to rein in where some of this cash is coming from. Uh, do you think his, his words have had impact? Do you think people are listening? Was he making valid points on, on what he had to say about NIL? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, you know, Deion Sanders, Coach Prime will tell you, he is all for players being able to capitalize off of their name, image, and their likeness. He's for it. Uh, he does have uh, a, a little, uh, you know, uh, reticence, people putting the NIL before the NFL, uh, you know, getting some opportunities before they've even played it down. Uh, but in general terms, he's for players being able to utilize their name, image, and likeness uh, for some products and goods and services and those kind of things. Uh, what he is speaking on uh, is when you see this influx of, of boosters uh, who are able to put together cash to recruit kids under the guise of, of NIL uh, who haven't played it down and what that does to the infrastructure 
uh, in the locker room and in the coaches' offices? And are these colleges and universities, particularly HBCUs, who are on the bottom of that pile as it relates to competing with that cash, are we equipped to even manage such a system? Uh, you know, our athletic departments, AD's offices, uh, do they have uh, the layer of staffing that can now deal with kids, with college kids, who are making more money than some of the administrators at the university? And how does that ripple effect go through your locker room when a guy that has a hundred grand in, in NIL uh, is getting deed up and shut down by a guy who has nothing, not even a barbershop deal? You know what that can mean to the integrity of the locker room. So uh, what he's speaking on is just simply this that when you got guys making professional money, they're going to start acting like professional players, and they're going to need some people around them to manage that process uh, professionally, much like the NFL has. Uh, so that's something he's concerned about. And, you know, whenever he speaks about football, he's been at the highest level of this game. I'm sure the NCAA and a lot of other people, it's like EF Hutton commercials, they listen when Coach Prime talks. Hey, only you and I and maybe 10% of the audience gets that, even remembers that commercial. When E.F. <laughs> Hutton speaks, everybody listens. Hey, uh, this, 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 this gray ain't, ain't that, man. That's age. I, I remember those commercials. <laughs> that, that was a big thing. Uh, if you don't know what E.F. Hutton is, go, go Google it, kids. Uh, <laughs> interesting juxtaposition. His son and his quarterback, Shadur Sanders, you know, forget HBCU. He, he has one of the better NIL portfolios of anybody playing college football. He, he's down with Tom Brady. He signed the deal with Gatorade. Uh, but, of course, money's not new to Shadura Sanders. Let's just keep it real. He, he grew up with the – we all know <laughs> his daddy was paid from the time he was born. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll say that to say uh, – what has or how has Shadura kind of, you think, set an example of, all right, so you get paid. It's still all about the work while we're here. Yeah, I think that's the focus. And I, I really think that, you know, uh, of course, Shadur Sanders being who he is, he is a genetically and biologically a Sanders. But when you look at his performance as a freshman quarterback, a lot of his uh, NIL stuff, if you will, uh, came after he was, you know, exploding numbers wise and, and doing his thing on the field. And he has those folks around him and namely in his head coach and father who can help him manage that system. I think one of the things that Coach Prime, uh, we talked about the juxtaposition, a lot of times when he speaks, he's not speaking about his challenges. He's speaking about challenges that he's aware of that other folks don't have the means uh, and the support systems around to manage these kind of layers that are coming at people, you know, drinking out of a hydrant, uh, not a not a, uh, a a hose pipe, if you will, but drinking out of a fire hydrant. These deals are coming fast, and they're coming at young people uh, that don't have a lot of experience in navigating them. And he's concerned about the infrastructure and management of that system for the entire system. Uh, you know, clearly we're going to have players uh, at Jackson State with the uh, microscope that's on us that when they perform, the phone is going to ring. Some of those players are going to, you know, get calls uh, b before they perform. Uh, and I, I would even say that if you look at Travis Hunter and the Kevin Coleman, what they did on national TV in the blue and white game before the regular season started, I'm sure their NIL value, you know, ticked up, if you will. Uh, so these opportunities are there. But what Coach Prime is calling for is like, hey, before this thing really just goes too fast, too far and off the cliff, let's come up with some management processes, some additional staff in these coaching rooms and additional staffs in these ADs office that can help keep some guardrails up to protect these young people. Yeah. Speaking of deals, man, I don't have a haircut deal either, Neely. My Eddie is, is uh, my Eddie Munster is all the way out today, hence the hat, man. So. Some of those deals start floating around Jackson, man. G give me a haircut deal. What, can you? Hey, I, I got a hat on too because I need a little, <laughs> little shape up. So I'm right with you. So maybe, maybe we can do a package deal. The HBC U game day, the pregame show barbershop deal. Keep Tolly and Neely looking fresh on these broadcasts and we'll shout you out. We need some help, brother. We need some help. Uh, you, you, you mentioned... Uh, we haven't talked in so long, man. It's like rapid fire topics today. You mentioned uh, not only some of the things Coach Sanders uh, talks about. It's not only about Jackson State, but, you know, dealing with other HBCUs. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, uh, he went down to Mississippi Valley State and kind of came back with the idea that, hey, we need to all help each other and, and improve the facilities, you know, not only where we are, but, you know, help somebody like Jackson who – Listen, everybody who has been there, the first thing they talk about after the game is the condition of the field. Let's just keep it 100, all right? We're not picking on anybody. It's, it's, not at all. It's, 
it's factual there. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you think that's going to float? Do you, do, you, do you see some, you feel some kumbaya energy can get behind that? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of kumbaya, but I also think there's going to be some pushback uh, because you're dealing in a HBCU space uh, that historically, you know, no pun intended with historically black colleges and universities, but historically we've operated siloed. You know, Jackson State will do what's in the best interest of Jackson State and Alcorn and Valley do what's in their best interest and see you on game day, you know, wish you the best, maybe maybe a little tongue in the cheek wish you the best. Uh, but what Coach Prime has brought to the table is that, hey, man, we are truly all in together. I want to beat everybody we play, but that's on game day. But we have got to raise the level of everybody in this conference, everybody in HBCUs. If we're going to get the respect from the NFL, if we're going to get the respect uh, from not just the players going into the NFL, uh, but our coaches who can be looked at as credible to move up to power fives and to move up to professional ranks, we all have to come up together. And, and Coach Prime and Coach Dancy really developed a strong relationship starting back at last year's Swag Media Day in Birmingham and have remained in close contact and, and have become brothers, if you will. And he's always vowed, man, I got to take a trip up to Valley. I want to go see him uh, because he was not able to be at the game when Valley hosted us there. Uh, that was during the time he was uh, recovering. Uh, and so he took that trip and did some touring and, and, and from that has doubled down on some commitments. You know, when we got our turf field, he committed then last summer that he was going to help uh, Valley uh, get a new field, even if it wasn't turf. And so after seeing the conditions and, and what Coach Dancy is doing uh, so much with so little, I think it really reinvigorated the fire under him to help out. And I think you're going to have a lot of folks from Jackson State support that, a lot of folks from Valley and just the HBCU space. But you're going to have some naysayers that are going to say, oh, here goes, here goes Deion Sanders making it about him, doing something for attention. But I think you will learn from Coach Dancy and others that he couldn't be more sincere when he's talking about we all got to come up together. We just can't do this for Jackson State. We got to do this for HBCUs all across the board, starting with those HBCUs in Mississippi, starting with those HBCUs in the SWAC. But it's got to be about everybody that we touch because no one's going to respect what we bring to the table if we're not playing and challenged by people who are on equal and competitive footing. You know, Neely, here's the thing that I don't understand. You know, it, it's all about self-awareness, right? Like, mm -hmm. Deion Sanders clearly understands, everybody understands, he's one of the most popular people in sports, and he hasn't played football since, what, 15, 20 years? Like, yeah. he has a huge megaphone. That, you know, to say he, look, he's not perfect. I'm not trying to, you know, carry water for him. You know, he makes mistakes like anybody else, but to understand the power of his voice and to lend it to things. Okay. That, why wouldn't you <laughs> like, yeah, I, you know, I, I share the same sentiment, Tolly. I don't know why people don't let the painter paint, you know, let this, let this, this guy's an artist, man. Let, let him do what he does. Get out of the way. You know, I understand everybody can't necessarily be down with it and help it, but you shouldn't be in a, in a position of trying to hinder it. Uh, you know, we sat down one of our first ever interviews, as far as our live show goes with the pregame show on game day for Jackson State was with Troy Aikman, uh, who came in to surprise Coach Prime on his first game uh, against Edward Waters here in Jackson. And, and Troy Aikman said it. He said, look, man, the thing about Dion, we all got gold jackets. We all were at high levels. But it's 20 years later, and people still know who he is and listen to him and follow him like he's still currently playing. And Troy said most of the people who played in our era they have lost that gravitas, but his has grown exponentially. So to attach that to what you're saying, you would be crazy to not let this guy get your megaphone and call attention to what your needs are and try to help because he has a huge following, a brand of people who want to help him succeed and pretty much whatever he touches succeeds. So I think that Valley is going to do well with this partnership and once you check those boxes, he'll move on to the next project and be helping somebody else because uh, he couldn't be more sincere about his efforts. All right. Quick time out. This is Tolly talking. The following few sentences are Tolly's opinion, not influenced, not representative of Neely. Folks, he ain't going to be here forever. Take advantage of it while you got it. <laughs> OK, if you want to talk about it after, go ahead. But don't mess up the bag now. If, if you get some coins out of that bag, 
Take it now. <laughs> Utilize well, it. Well, All right. Charlie, you didn't ask me, but I'll throw a log on that fire because I totally concur with you in that. Uh, Coach Prime and I talk often, and one of the things we do not talk about uh, is his departure because he has made it clear that he is here, he is where he wants to be, and he is about this mission. Now, let's put that to the side. The W.C. Gordon, Big John Merritt, uh, Eddie Robinson era of coaching somewhere 20, 25 years is gone. Nowhere in college football does that happen any, anymore. One thing that you we know is what you just articulated. At some point, Deion Sanders is no longer at Jackson State, no longer in the SWAC. Wherever he is, that's up to him. But while we have him, why would we get in the way? It makes absolutely no sense. You know, let's let's harness this energy and this synergy. Let's grow and let's put some infrastructure in place at these institutions that are able to be there even after he's gone. You know, that's one of the things that we have failed to do in HBCUs, particularly in SWAC football, is most of the time when a new coach is taking over from a former coach, he's not inheriting a program that is a better standard than when the previous coach got. We have an opportunity uh, with McClellan as commissioner, with coaches that are around the SWAC and not just these NFL guys, but just the caliber of coaching that we're developing. We have an opportunity here now in this era, the next two to five years as coaches changes, you're inheriting programs that have a foundation now and you're not starting all the way over. That's the kind of thing that needs to be embraced. You know, I tell people all the time, wherever the Deion Sanders goes next, he ain't taking that turf field with him. He ain't taking that new locker room with him. You know, we got some stuff that has to stay. So let's keep on replicating that and let's replicate it around our sister universities. Yeah. You know, I had the thought uh, this week, I was thinking about just some things in my own personal life uh, where somebody was helping me uh, and it was helping me get to this thing that I had been thinking about and, and you know, dreaming about. And I was like, man, I didn't. I didn't visualize it happening this way. My thought process was I was going to do all the steps and do everything and do all the lifting and I was going to achieve this thing. Right. And this other mm -hmm. person was like, oh, man, I can help you. And I got all this to help you with. And I was like, well, hmm, does it really matter that I get to the point that I wanted to get to and it happened with somebody else helping me equally and I don't get to take all the oh, look what I did. And I was like, you know, what? it really doesn't matter because it's, it's about the end end goal. So, you know, some of the places we want to be and get to, you don't have to do it all by yourself. You don't. And, and Tali, you hit it, man. One of the things we have to do is constantly remind ourselves as individuals, constantly remind ourselves as organizations, media outlets like HBCU Game Day or the pregame show, is that it's not about us. It's not about the individuals. It's not about Tali. It's not about Neely. It's not about Deion Sanders. It's truly about these HBCUs, which are truly about these young people. So it's about these students and these student athletes. What can we put in place to better their lives, change their lives, not only here and now, but generationally? And so that's what it's about. When you know people try to spin it and say people are just doing that because they want it to be about them, they want the attention on them. We can't get bogged down in the naysayers and folks who want to get in the way. Uh, we got a mission to accomplish, and you know tomorrow's not promised one way or the other. So we got work to do. Man, there was this lady on the Breakfast Club, and I don't know her name. Uh, I wish I did so I could attribute it to her directly, but I stopped and listened to, to the clip. She said, the elephant marches on while the dogs are barking. <laughs> like, <laughs> well said. like people on the side, rawr, 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 and the elephant keeps right on, right on well going, said. man. And what, mm -hmm. what type of fool would that elephant look like if it stopped to argue with every dog along the way, yip-yapping? Uh, up on the porch. That's a great uh, one. Coming up this uh, summer, there's some more kind of collaborative things. There's exposure camps, like kind of like a lot of people are invited. What, what's going on there? Yeah, uh, you know, the uh, uh, first, first before we get to the camps, you know, our own players will be coming back around Memorial Day weekend, those who are going to summer school. Uh, then Coach Prime has opened up another walk-on tryout. Uh, for Jackson State, which will be held that Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, which he's going to personally attend and supervise and manage to add those last walk-ons. And, and before people uh, think that's no big deal, I want to point out that Robert Brazil was a walk-on at Jackson State. He went from walk-on to the, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So you never know what you're going to find, diamonds in the rough in that walk-on category. So he is sincere about giving folks an opportunity to be a part of this program and letting them get the, the, the exposure and privilege of playing with this program, even if there are any scholarships less for them. 
Uh, then that next weekend, Coach Prime is hosting his camps, uh, which start uh, on that Thursday and run through Friday and Saturday. Some basic skill camps and then culminating with seven on seven with people bringing in teams from all around the nation. So that first weekend in June, Memorial Day weekend when everybody's getting back and that first weekend in June, going to be a lot of traffic around Jackson State Athletics and Jackson State football as we truly, truly, Tolly, start to turn and the focus becomes week one FAMU in Miami. Mm, man, that, gosh, this was a quick year. This was a quick year, but a lot of stuff happened. Uh, you talked about walk-ons. Santee Marshall was like, a year ago, he was like the camera dude, right? And yeah. Season yeah. ends, he's, he's out there running the rock. Yeah, and uh, Coach Prime, when I spoke to him just the other day, he is excited uh, about the run game opportunity. You know, he's looking at it as a run game by committee. I think you're going to see some noise from J.D. Martin, number eight, uh, and Santee Marshall as well, 38 special, number 38 in his jersey, uh, who, as you said, he came from cameraman and not even the head cameraman. He was what they call the key grip or gaffer or something in, in the industry. I don't know. Uh, but he went from uh, from that to to running run the ball and being our starting running back. So I think with this new offensive scheme under Coach Brett Barlone, offensive coordinator, uh, you're probably going to see different batch use at different times. Uh, but just the other day when I talked to Coach Prime, man, he was excited uh, about that run game and seeing what these guys are going to do this summer going into the fall. Let, let me ask you this, man, and, and I want to ask it delicately in my brain. I'm thinking, ask this delicately, but I think I'm just going to have to come out and say it because right. I don't I don't have enough words to beat around the bush. Um, there's been a lot of white kids that wanted to come play at Jackson State who have committed. I've never had a problem with white players at HBCUs. When I was at Winston-Salem State, one of my favorite quarterbacks, uh, Josh McGee, the uh, white kid, loved Josh, watched him in high school. It doesn't matter to me. Some people have issues with it. But my point and my question I want to throw out to you is, like, people are looking at this as a football program, not just an HBCU football program. You know, one thing, Tom, now, I'm really glad you, you brought this, this subject up because it's something that Coach Prime has touched on uh, that major media or fans, whatever, just kind of skip over and, and don't put a little limelight on it as I think is, is needed. Uh, you know, Coach Prime is one of those kind of people, man. He is not going to ask somebody or demand something from somebody that he's not willing to do himself. And so one thing that he has said on the record, off the record, is that there's no way that I can go out here and beat the drum that black coaches move up into power fives in the NFL, but HBCUs are not willing to hire what are our minorities, which are white coaches. So you see diversity in his staff. You see diversity in his locker room. What he looks at is if you can contribute, if you have something to offer this program, I'm not looking at the racial component of it. Uh, yes, the B in HBCU is for black, but one of the biggest things about HBCUs was just opportunity. You know, it was a way for people who had no other way to get a way. And you see him doing that uh, with the recruits that are coming in that are non-traditional because they're not black student athletes, they're white. Uh, and even the diversity amongst his coaching staff. Uh, you see white coaches who are, are, are part of this program and, and calling shots and out there recruiting and because he firmly believes, he sincerely believes, we can't go demand the NFL hire us when we won't hire anybody that looks different either. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's hypocritical. And, and one thing he's big on is not being a hypocrite. So he puts his time and message and money where his mouth is, and you're going to see a diverse team. It's not going to be – Either the coaching office or on the field, it's not going to just be one race or the other. I'm, I'm glad you said that. I know I was talking about the players, but you brought up coaches. Um, mm -hmm. There's the clip going around of what Stephen A. Smith had to say about Grambling, uh, and you know he brought up uh, he brought up Hugh hiring Art Bryles. Which look, if you if you got the controversy about you know what did or didn't happen at Baylor, that, whatever. I'm I'm not weighing in on that. Sure. Uh, but he took issue with Art Browse being white and talking about well, HBCUs are supposed to be the place to, you know, where black coaches get a chance. I was like, you can't hire no white people. You can't hire any. Sorry for the yeah. double negative. You can't hire any white people. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's short sighted. You know, uh, I, I, I totally understand where Stephen A is going to going going to and coming from. You know, once upon a time in our history, we were the only people who honored our degrees. Uh, so you had a lot of folks who would graduate from Jackson State and become employees at Jackson State because they couldn't get a job at Notre Dame. 
Uh, and so that same thing would happen and permeate through the coaching ranks, uh, where you would see African-American coaches with SWAC or HBCU credential just kind of shuffle around the block. But again, Coach Prime is just big on, man, we can't demand, you know, the NFL to enforce a Rooney rule and do more for us when we're not willing to do the same thing. Because at the end of the day, it's not so much about the racial component of it. It's about the opportunity. Uh, so, I mean, we our defensive line coach is white. Our offense coordinator is white. Our tight ends coach is white. We got strength and conditioning coaches that are white. Uh, you know, we got players, be they backup quarterbacks uh, or special to specialists on special teams. You know, he he's just not looking at race. He is recruiting talented people who all they need is an opportunity to succeed because that just lends, not only is it right, Tom, it just lends credibility to when you go knocking on somebody else's door and asking them for something, at least you're on record that you have provided what you're asking for. Well, let me just take a moment to let the people in the comments section get busy. I know they are typing right now. They are typing. I see the Oh, I see the smoke coming off the keyboards there. <laughs> wow. Uh, I saw on Instagram at uh, the, the Palatial Prime Estate, uh, I think it's called AKA Country Prime. I saw this whole football field uh, that uh, Shadur and Shiloh and, and maybe some of the wide receivers can come over. Uh, man, they got a whole football field at the house, man. Yeah, you know, when Chuck and I went out to Country Prime back in February, uh, that football field was under construction. And, and uh, it was Coach Prime's vision is to, you know, give his sons a place where they could work out, you know, in the offseason. So it's not a true regulation, you know, 100-yard field from goalpost to goalpost. But it is enough where you can run some nice go routes. Uh, and so I think that this summer what you see in the offseason is, you know, absent of Coach Prime, he has nothing to do with it. Shadur Sanders, QB1, will be able to have his – receivers, his friends, his classmates, you know, come to the house and, and work on some routes and that kind of thing. Same thing with Shiloh and, and the secondary. So uh, Country Prime now has a football field. Uh, it has an inclined spring heel. So everything they need is is right there to, to not have an excuse to be in Jackson to work out. So, uh, I, you know, that's, that is something that took place last summer. Uh, you know, Shador Sanders had his receivers, uh, you know, meet him in the offseason to do some things together, uh, absence of, of the coaches. So, that's probably going to continue this year. And now they got a true football field to do it on right out the front door. Hey, man, Shadur is going to have to pick up the tab when it's time to feed them boys, man. <laughs> At least give them the Gatorade. I know he's good for that. <laughs> Gatorade and and uh, and, and, and uh, yogurt. He's got those deals. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, man. <laughs> that's enough here. Eat some yogurt. Drink some Gatorade. Let's go. Um, <laughs> Let's talk, touch on basketball real quick. Uh, Amisha Williams Holiday got drafted by the Indiana Fever, the first HBCU player uh, in the WNBA to be drafted in, in 20 years. Uh, she made it to the last ah, last cut, uh, didn't make the, the regular season squad. Uh, but that notwithstanding, how big of an impact do you think that was just to see a Jackson State player uh, get drafted into the WNBA? Uh, man, it, it was huge. And, and you compounded with, you know, here in a matter of weeks, you have a player get drafted in basketball and a player get drafted in football, you know, in James Houston. So, and, and the history of it, for her to be the first in 20 years, for her to be Coach Tamika Reed's first player, uh, for, you know, she's a transfer player as well uh, who came into Jackson State with some personal challenges and worked with Coach Reed and convinced her, no, you still have something to offer basketball and basketball still has something to offer you led the SWAC in just about every category you can imagine uh, for two or three seasons there and gets her name called first pick of the third round. You know, WNBA is much different from football. One, there's only three rounds. Uh, and then you go in, you're not just kind of guaranteed a roster spot, if you would, as you will, in, in, in the NFL, you picked in those first couple of rounds. Uh, so she was there to prove that 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 HBCU talent, Jack State talent is draftable. Uh, and I'm confident, Tyler, that she's going to still end up on the roster somewhere. Uh, you know, the, the Fever had a huge draft class. Uh, they were not going to be able to keep everybody. Uh, but the thing she was able to do in camp with the word of mouth of those coaches and the film that she was able to produce, uh, she'll still be playing professional basketball somewhere, uh, just not with the team that drafted her. But that does not diminish the history that was truly made on the night that her name was called. Man, and just for context, I mean, there are first-round draft picks that get cut in the WNBA. Like, Certainly. 
There, so, there are, I think one girl was, was rookie, one young lady was rookie of the year, and like two years later, she, like she got released. It, 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 that is probably the toughest roster to make in all of professional sports. Uh, that league has 12 teams, you know, average about 12 roster spots per team. You got new players coming in every year, veterans coming back. That, that's a tough ticket. So just to get drafted and, and, and be considered – and, and still have potential, like you said, uh, that's definitely nothing to be ashamed of, man, at all. Not at, not at all. You know, history was made, man. You know, it's, it's, it's been 20 years, and her name was called, uh, first pick of that third round, and uh, she went there and did her thing and represented her family, her name, uh, Jackson State, the SWAC and HBCUs very well. Nothing to be ashamed of in being released, as you said, Tyler, probably the toughest professional sport to land on the roster of the people who pitch you, uh, you know, so there's still going to be opportunities in the WNBA opportunities, you know, overseas, of course, for her to play professional basketball. So you have not heard the last of a mission. And those girls hang in there, man. I mean, Sue Bird, Diana Taurasi, they've been playing forever. Yeah. <laughs> they keep coming back. Uh, so that, that is a tough one, but I would say this to, to everyone watching. We have to support women's sports. Like, people are like, well, why don't they get more teams? Like, we got to go to the games. We got to buy the merchant. Like, for that league to grow and expand, like, the support has to has to increase. So so we all play a part in that as well. But we definitely uh, wish Amisha the best. You know, the, the best part to me, man, the, the thing that really touched me was, uh, man, uh, Coach Reed went with her to Indiana, stayed with her that weekend, man. They, they posted, you know, had that post, man. It looks like they were praying together. Like, she coached her up until the very uh, last minute, man. I, I thought that was really cool. Isn't that just beautiful about HBCUs and, and, and why you go to HBCUs? Uh, you know, it really is family, uh, and it just it does not stop just because you leave the institution. I, I don't think you've seen a head coach – of women basketball go with their player as part of a support system, you know, to help them navigate those first 72 to 96 hours of that process. Uh, and to see coach Reed, you know, with her player and say, no, this, this is my player for life. This is my baby for life. This is like a, another child for me. Uh, and, and to see their relationship, you know, unfold on social media during that process, you could see, you know, the sincerity in it. And it just, to me, it just speaks well to what HBCUs are about. The coaches, the Falcons, the staff, the alums, the fans, they care. It's not just about cheering you on game day and uh, when you're gone, you're gone. They care for life. Yeah, you talk about good coaches. Uh, we can parlay that into good parenting. We cannot forget to send a big congratulations to, to, to the quiet but driving force at the pregame show, Miss Alexis, your daughter who earned her master's degree uh, last weekend. Way to go, Neely. Good job, man. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't do anything, but thank you. <laughs> I did. I, my work was like 26 years ago. And it's probably only about three minutes. <laughs> but she, only you, only you, man. But, uh, she, she, she's daddy, she's daddy's girl. I can tell, man. She, I can tell. She is, and we are, man. We are proud of her. You know, the pregame show, uh, in all seriousness, would not be what it is without her, her skill sets on the camera, skill sets and just understanding technology and managing it, the process and dealing with HBCU game day. You know, she's our buffer and talks to Tali because he talks in you know, this, this computer language Chuck and I don't understand. <laughs> Certainly Chuck doesn't understand it. Uh, so she has been a godsend and she has officially finished film school. Uh, and so she is a master's degree holder now in out there freelancing and looking at other opportunities. So we'll see where Alexis Neely lands next. That's awesome, man. That's really awesome. Uh, big plans for the summer. I, I know you guys uh, have a lot of things to cover, obviously. Uh, what, what are you most excited about this summer, man, coming up for the pregame show? Well, you know, uh, it really ties to the spring, Tyler, because, you know, this spring was our first true off season where we were able to do some installs, some conditioning. So I'm looking forward to June and July and August as players trickle in, those who will be going to summer school and doing workouts as we really get ready, ready to prepare for week one FAMU in Miami. I'm looking forward to seeing how things have progressed this summer compared to last summer 
you know, not having a spring conditioning and installation and having one. Uh, because I, and, and, you know, Coach Prime and I literally talked about just the other day. If we didn't learn anything last season, we all learned fans, whether you Jackson State, FAMU, or just college sports fans in general, we all learned how important week one is for the Horns Blossom Classic. Because if that game goes the other way, neither team lost again a conference game after that game. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to these guys getting back in here this summer, you know, sharing our content on a weekly and regular basis uh, with HBCU game day so people can see what's going on at Jackson State as Coach Prime gets prepared for that true second season, which is now pretty much all his team. Uh, you know, these guys who are here and on scholarships and that kind of thing uh, are truly just about this team is made up of people that he's put together. So it's going to be interesting to see, Tali, how that compares last summer to this summer. And even when the season goes, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be tough to be undefeated. You know, that's just hard to do, but that's the standard. That's what he's shooting for. Uh, he doesn't want to just want to win. He wants to dominate. So that's why he changed offensive schemes. Going to be interesting to see how it all comes together, how we have to battle through those adverse, those adverse moments this summer to get ready for week one. Are fans going to be griping about the offensive line this year? That that was the big gripe last year. O-line, O-line, O-line. What, what do you think? We'll see Labor Day. You know, we'll see Labor Day weekend in Miami. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of opportunity for fans to see uh, in between that time. I'm sure there, you know, maybe this summer be an open scrimmage or practice as the summer goes on. But I will tell you this. There's been a sincere, concerted, dogged effort to improve that offensive line. Uh, you have players who have come out of the portal who will be joining us. Uh, you have some people who have departed. So there's been some some form to say, you know, some addition via subtraction. Uh, so all indicators are the offensive line is going to be better. And I'll tell you this, Tyler, with this new offensive system, when you see the installs and what Coach Brett has up his sleeve, they have to be better. You know, they're going to have to play and participate. Uh, they're going to have to move fast. Uh, they, this is an offense that does not, you know, walk to the ball. They run to the ball. Uh, so that offensive line is going to be under a microscope and, and going to be scrutinized, scrutinized, and scrutinized. But I think the unit that will be put together over the summer that you'll see in Miami is going to be the unit that can handle that pressure. I meant to ask you this a long time ago. I, I seem to notice from afar as I kind of watch uh, that Coach Sanders has seemed to Get a little bit of that mojo personality uh, back on on the other side, and I know he's probably still has a lot to go through. But you know, on the, on the other side of healing and recovery, it, you know, it it just seemed like you could see that extra kind of ten percent in him. Was was it palpable to you? Uh, could you notice that? I, I think you're spot on again, man. You you hit it. Uh, he's back. You know, clearly he is. You know, a ways from 100%, you can still see a little hitch in the giddy up every now and then. Uh, but he is cart free and scooter free as much as he can be. Uh, he's doing his workouts, you know, on the elliptical machine and his weight program. Uh, most of, for the most part, when he's walking, he's walking like he used to walk. Uh, his sense of humor is fully restored. Uh, his energy is fully restored. I would imagine that's only going to pro progress across the summer. Because uh, he made a commitment to himself uh, that, you know, that I'm not going to be, you know, on a scooter or on, uh, needing a cart or any assistance when we get this season started. So I'm doing everything I can, which included sitting down and resting uh, when he could to be ready. So I think he's way ahead of schedule. When you're around him, uh, you know, he's getting up unassisted, sitting down unassisted, walking unassisted. Uh, so I, I think he's ahead of schedule. And uh, that cart is going to be parked by midsummer. <laughs> I think the sense of humor is what I noticed. I, I noticed the ability to laugh along with players when, you know, players were kind of making videos imitating him. His, his daughter was, you know, for the most non funniest thing ever was, was making fun of his foot and calling it a turkey leg or whatever. Yeah. And he seemed to be going along with it. And, and that was the thing I noticed that made me feel like, OK, he, he's kind of getting back in, into his form. It's hard to laugh when you're hurting. So you clearly know the pain, you know, is subsiding there and he's getting back to normal. But that Coach Prime smile and that Coach Prime attitude is really back all the way. What about these high school coaches? We, we're going we're gonna to get that. There's been a lot of discussion uh, from Coach Sanders about 
Uh, don't don't send me don't send me little Johnny. I, I want to see Big Ricky. I think was was his exact words. Uh, there was some you know response like, hey, you know, some of these HBCU coaches don't respond to us. Those high school coaches. How much how much bridge gapping do you think uh, still needs to happen both ways on, on that level? Yeah, I think we got some growing to do on both sides of that equation. Uh, you know, I think HBCUs in general, we got to up our standards. Uh, and demand access to the best of the best. Uh, and I think that uh, the high school coaches, you know, have to stop looking at us as second class citizens uh, and make sure that we have that access. Because again, HBCUs from an education standpoint uh, can compete and exceed. And certainly from a football uh, standpoint can compete and exceed. But we're still dealing with those vestiges of yesteryear uh, where you kind of tiered when you go and recruit that they earmark these guys for power five these guys for JUCOs and these guys for HBCUs and these guys for, you know, even, even smaller colleges, uh, but coach prime is not going to tolerate that. He believes we deserve the best. He believes we have the best to offer. And so we need to be able to sit down and recruit the best. Uh, and as he said, the coaches that have been doing it, this is your final warning. I'm putting this warning out globally, but next time I'm calling names. Mm, that'll be interesting. Uh, I think the big word of the day goes to Neely. You know, I'm, I popped out palpable um, with part of my challenge, not only using the word correctly in context, but pronouncing it right. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. And you responded with vestiges. I, I, I think you win today. You know, we had a class at Jackson State called Word Power. Had to take it. You had to take word power, no matter what your major was. It was a freshman year class like guidance or, you know, university success or history. You had to take word power, Tyler, and you had to learn these words and how to use them. Malcolm X once said, a man's world is only limited by his vocabulary. So we're going to always step our word game up on the pregame show. Wow. At Winston-Salem State, we had uh, fried chicken Fridays. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, Rams. I saw an opportunity for a joke. I was trying to be self-deprecating, make Neely look Just good. We, we had real courses, too. Well, our, our fried chicken was on Wednesday. Is that when Wednesday. it was? I, I was trying to think. Was it fried chicken Wednesday or fried chicken the Friday? Friday is catfish down here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. O only thing I remember about the calf during, during my time was uh, pepper steak and uh, corned beef hash. I swear that was every morning and, and pepper steak. We had that more than anything else, man. It's, uh, you know, the, they had the freshman 15. I, I think I had about the freshman 45 after, after yeah, my it, first year, man. It happens to the best of us, man. <laughs> but I've been holding steady in my later years. Here. All right, good. Neely, I think we have touched on everything I wanted to talk about with the I love Jackson State. I do like your new hat. You've gone from the J hat to... The kind of block style. Uh, can, can can I get some for the set? Like I, I'd just, love to have a hat or two, man. I'll hook you up, man. Just a little trucker vibe, you know. Just give the people a little something different. But yeah. you know that 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 block J is always around, and uh, people fear when they see it because they know somebody's about to sign it. <laughs> I've yet to see the J be defeated on the table. When it's on the table, it is, it is undefeated. I, I can give you that much. Uh, Neely, thank you so much. If you're out there watching and you stayed through this, uh, a lot of information, but a few shenanigans and just inside conversation oh. with me and Neely, we appreciate you hanging around as well. Uh, probably means you saw a couple of advertisements. So that's really, really, really good. Uh, Neely, we'll talk soon, man. Uh, you take it easy. Give our best and a slap to the back of the head to Charles Bishop, and uh, we'll catch up with you later, brother. Will do, man. Always a pleasure, again, to work with HBCU Game Day. Appreciate what you guys are doing for the mission and the cause. And we're not done yet, man. Let's uh, let's keep going and showcasing what we have to offer these HBCUs. And nobody can tell our story better than we can. And we don't have to get anybody's permission to tell it.